Okay. Um, I'm just sorry, my Wi Fi is kind of crap. I just tried to connect to Hotspot, but it's not really working. So if I suddenly drop off, I will come back because I'll go on my 4G. But anyway, okay. So just going to start off with an SBA. Um, so if people want to like type their thoughts in the chat. Give it 30 seconds before you type an answer so everyone has the time to process. So if anyone has any ideas, you can put stuff in the chat now. So does anyone does anyone have an idea what the diagnosis is or what's going on if you don't know management? Any suggestions? Feel free to talk as usual as well. Addisonian crisis. Yeah, wonderful. OK, don't worry. That's fine. This is like the whole point of this is that um, Addisonian crises are so like non-specific. That's why we're going through it. Um, so does anyone know what you do, what drug you give in Addisonian crisis? Uh, yeah, you give hydrocortisone. Well done. Um, so don't worry if you didn't get this because this is like the whole point is that, like I said, they are so non-specific and it's, it can be quite difficult to pick up. Basically, someone in an Addisonian crisis essentially is shocked. So if you had fluids there, you would also want to fluid resuscitate them immediately. But I just wanted to highlight what drug you give. Um, so basically, even if you suspect an Addisonian crisis, you're going to give them, you're going to treat them with hydrocortisone without waiting to confirm it from investigations, just because it's so critical and the patient is so unwell. Um, and does anyone know why you don't, in a crisis, give fluid cortisone as well? Um, I think it's because you don't, because you give such high doses of hydrocortisone, you don't need to give the fluid cortisone because it also acts on the mineralocorticoid receptors. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it is. Well done. So we give, yeah, exactly. We give a high dose of hydrocortisone. So exactly what you said, it exerts like mineralocorticoid action as well. So you don't have to give them fluidocortisone with it. And just based on the history, what do you think has precipitated this crisis? We're going to go through this properly in this, in this, in the talk, but can anyone guess what might have caused her to have a crisis? Um, yeah, the pneumonia, exactly, so illness, essentially. Okay, so if we go back through kind of the fizz of Addison's disease, um, if you all remember from second year, the HPA axis, so the hypothalamus um, releases CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone, acts on the pituitary gland, which releases ACTH, and then that acts on the adrenal cortex and releases cortisol. And as we all know about negative feedback, if you're increasing one, then it will stop like the step before it so we don't get overproduction and Addison's disease is basically destruction of the adrenal cortex so what happens is you don't get production of cortisol or aldosterone which is a mineralocorticoid which we're talking about um and it's a primary adrenal insufficiency because the problem is in the adrenal cortex it's not like in the pituitary gland or the hypothalamus um and like i said it's really non-specific um in terms of crises so uh, in Addison's disease, are we going to have a high or low ACTH? Considering this is primary adrenal insufficiency. Yeah, exactly. It's going to be high. Whereas if it was secondary adrenal insufficiency, so the problems before the adrenal cortex, then we're going to have low. It will be low. So in Addison's, you know it's going to be raised. Um, so that's just a quick recap of, of that. Um, can anyone tell me what the most common cause is of Addison's either in the world or in the UK?
autoimmune destruction. Um, so not tapering is a good point for if we suddenly withdraw steroids and they might go into crisis. Um, but in terms of Addison disease in general, autoimmune destruction is the most common cause for the UK. Well done. Does anyone know what it is worldwide? Don't know if this is kind of past medi. It's very past medi, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a good one, though. It's like one of the answers to almost any question in medicine. <laughs> yeah. Crossover with a bit of mod A, TB. Yeah, well done. That's the most common cause worldwide. Um, so basically, with autoimmunity, we get um, antibodies against the adrenal cortex or the enzyme. 21 alpha hydroxylase and that is present with a lot of people so these antibodies are really specific for um Addison's disease and if you identify in a healthy person it basically means that quite a high risk of having adrenal failure later um does anyone know what the condition um so these are just some other causes if you have met to the adrenal glands and lymphoma opportunistic infections and HIV which attack the adrenal glands but can anyone tell me what there's a syndrome, a weird name, an eponymous syndrome for adrenal hemorrhage, which can cause Addison, Addison's disease. Oh yeah, for TB. Water has Friedrichs then. Yeah, exactly, well done. So that's basically, it's, no, that's fine. It's a weird one to spot, but it's basically caused by Neisseria meningitides is the bacterial cause of it. And it's basically when you get really severe bacterial infection by that and you get hemorrhage into the adrenal glands and it stops them working essentially um so that's just a random cause as well but basically the most common causes are autoimmunity and also um tb how does lymphoma affect the adrenal glands to be honest i'm not completely sure anush do you have any idea about i, I don't mean, know the mechanism it's destructive it infiltrates the adrenal yeah. glands yeah, and just destroys it met. Yeah, like when you have Met's adrenal gland in it, yeah, infiltrates. Um, generally, sarcoid, TB and cancers all destroy things in the body by the same mechanism, which is just infiltration. As a general rule, so it's always it's always infiltration, pretty much. Or compression with lymphoma sometimes, but mainly infiltration. OK, there you go. Um, so what symptoms in normal just in Addison's disease would you find in a patient any any symptoms you guys can think of yeah so they get yeah low blood pressure especially they get postural hypertension so hypotension, so standing up and the drop in blood pressure. Yeah, abdominal pain, fever, dizziness. Um, so I don't think they would generally normally have a fever, but potentially like if they've been ill and then it's precipitated crisis, then they could have a fever, be running a fever from the illness. Anything, uh, does anyone know what happens to your mood? In, yeah, what exactly, what happens to their glucose? If we remember some fizz from second year, if you have, what does cortisol do to glu blood glucose normally? And we don't have cortisol in Addison's. Yeah, hypoglycemia, sorry. Would you get, yeah, you get low blood glucose, exactly. So cortisol normally increases um, blood glucose concentrations, but we don't have that in Addison's obviously. So it's hypoglycemia. Um, and oh, gosh, lots of yeah, these are all good. So I'm going to go through some hyperpigmentation. Yeah. So the thing, the kind of thing, like uh, this is in the Oxford Handbook, but it's kind of useful to remember tanned, tired, tearful, because people forget you can also get um psych symptoms with that. So people can be quite low in mood and get depressed. Basically, they can even have psychosis. Um and yeah, so I think you basically said all these. And because it's autoimmune, these people are kind of the classic thing they like to 
like make you think about is the fact that they're going to be predisposed to other autoimmune conditions so something like vitiligo or like pernicious anemia so things autoimmune conditions basically um so these are the main things basically if you have especially in like SPA land if you have a patient with kind of unexplained abdo pain vomiting and it just seems really vague um you should have Addison's as a differential in your mind because it, it can present so vaguely um and yeah so this is a photo this was a case from the Lancet that I found this from last year and you can see that they've got kind of darkening on the mucous membranes and um, for this patient he had had it gradually over like seven years so it can be a really gradual process but that's just something to look out for on examination so you want to look inside the mouth and also on the hands and you can see on the feet as well he's got hyperpigmentation um so if we talk about general investigations what kind of what are we going to see in their bloods like electrolyte imbalances what what are the kind of hallmark things for Addison's There's like one small phrase we're looking for. Ah. <laughs> Sorry, my thing's not loading. Yeah, low sodium and high potassium. Exactly. Well done. Um, and does anyone know there's also another mineral which is raised in Addison's, which people kind of forget about, but they kind of they like to they like you to know that. That was a very like vague description for me, but it's anyway, it's an, an, another mineral is raised in Addison's. The clue is it's not in a U, a standard set of yeah. urea and electrolytes. It's not using ease. Not quite. Calcium, yes, yeah, so you get raised calcium as well. Um, also, by the way, with the um, hyperpigmentation, you get it because the ACTH basically works on the melanocytes as well, and they get increased because we have too much ACTH in Addison's and they um, get increased production of melanin. So that's what causes the hyperpigmentation. So yeah, low sodium and high potassium because you haven't got aldosterone, which normally does the opposite of that. So it kind of reabsorb it causes reabsorption of sodium and it normally excretes potassium, but we don't have that. So we get the opposite effect. Um, high calcium, we talked about low glucose because there's low um, cortisol. And also we already talked about the fact that the ACTH is going to be high because this is primary um adrenal insufficiency um and like in the uk because we've got high auto um high oh well done didn't know that there was high magnesium just learned that um because the most common cause is autoimmunity in the uk and we've got basically these adrenal auto antibodies which is going to be positive if they have autoimmune if the um cause is autoimmune and if you wanted to do imaging you could basically look for adrenal calcification um but the big thing to remember is for like i said at the beginning just really emphasize for crises you're not gonna you're just gonna treat them if you you're clinically suspecting that they're in an analysis crisis you're not gonna wait for sodium and like acth and the potassium for you to confirm that you just want to treat them um so does anyone know what the gold standard investigation is for to diagnose addison's like to confirm it Yeah, exactly. Well done. So it's called called um called the ACTH stimulation test or the short um synaphthen test, which is ACTH. Um, so exactly, you basically give them synthetic ACTH to stimulate it, the adrenal gland, and um obviously normally that would cause the adrenal glands to produce cortisol. But if the glands are destroyed, like they are in Addison's, they they can't produce it. They won't be stimulated, so cortisol won't rise. So basically, if you've given the ACTH and after 30 minutes, the cortisol has risen above 550 nanomoles, then it means that it's not Addison's because if it was Addison's, the cortisol wouldn't have been stimulated. Um, so just for your information, if you're in primary care and you want to check, you could do a 9 a.m. serum cortisol. So if you, again, I mean, that's quite standard, isn't it? If it's very high, these are just some cutoffs, then it's obviously it's quite unlikely um, and it's kind of intermediate, then you definitely need to do an ACTH um, test to rule it out, but basically, if you're diagnosing Addison's, you want to do um, the simulation test. OK, so another SBA for you. So 
So what are we doing with her medication when she gets ill? Yeah, so for the first SBA, basically the trigger is that it is really vague, but essentially you see that someone's recently become ill. So she had pneumonia and then she's just kind of gone into shock, basically, which is what is. And basically infection is something that precipitates absence crisis. And the crises are basically they're shocked. They got abdo pain. They're like confused they're vomiting. They're really unwell. So it is quite vague. But the trigger is basically the shock following on from an illness. Um, what have people said? D. Yeah, exactly. When in, um, when someone with absence is ill, you want to double their stories, so you double just hydrocortisone. So if we go on to um, the management, so what are we replacing in people with absence? I mean, we kind of touched upon it already, but just general absence disease. So we've said that they're going to need hydrocortisone. Corticosteroids, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So basically we're going to give them, oh, that all came up once. We're going to give them hydrocortisone and fluidocortisone every day. Um, I don't know if you actually need to know the doses or the amounts, but just for your information. Um, but the, what, the big thing to remember is that you, because to stop them getting like getting into a crisis because in illness stress and injury or kind of your requirement for cortisol goes up so you want they should anticipate it and they need to double their steroids basically when that when they become unwell um and people with absence should have a bracelet to declare the fact that they have steroid use so it helps if they are found in a crisis basically and then you can quickly tell um and just some other minor points like before exercise they can add um some hydrocortisone to their intake and they should also when you're um giving them their information and their tablets and stuff you should also ha they should have injections available to them in case they become unwell and they can't take them orally so they should be able to do im hydrocortisone basically um and just for screening every year you want to check their blood pressure they use and ease to make sure it's all kind of in normal range and like i said before watch out for autoimmune disease so like vitiligo pernicious anemia um so we try to give them the hydrocortisone in the first half of the day does anyone know why we're doing that there's a side effect we're trying to avoid yeah so basically exactly so it basically they get insomnia if, you, if they have it too late it keeps them awake so that's just a little side effect to be aware of um so I've just done a slide on kind of counselling tips. So if you for steroid use, so if you got it like um, in an OSCE or something, kind of things that you need to be aware of when you're telling a patient, when you're talking to a patient that's going to be taking like high dose steroids for a prolonged period of time. Um, so like general things which we, you would do for any drug, you need to tell them about side effects. So just side effects of steroids, which I'm sure you all remember so things like increased appetite weight gain um recurrent infections because of course soul suppresses your immune system the mood changes just like things like that for them to watch out for and be aware and um, the fact that you take it in the morning once daily um so you give that and like we said to prevent something you don't want it late in the evening and also you might give them a ppi as well um so because for steroid induced peptic ulcers basically is prophylaxis for that and also you want to mention that you also might consider giving them bisphosphonate um because of the risk of osteoporosis so for patients taking high dose of steroids which Addison's people are doing every day um you want to kind of make sure that's included and like already what i said before just don't forget about with Addison's um having the steroid bracelet or like an emergency card saying that they take steroids and the fact that you need to double it in illness and kind of stressful periods basically um 
so these are just some points you can come back to it but basically side effects you want to take it in the morning ppis because to prevent peptic ulcers and alindronic acid um so bisphosphonates um so yeah just to be aware of that if you had a station on acids and then you had to talk to a patient about their man the management of their disease you you would want to talk to like you would want to make it known that you're aware of the kind of side effects and things that they should look out for. OK, so what do we do for an Addisonian crisis? What kind of what management are we doing? I know obviously I gave you one of the answers for the first SBA. Bear in mind this patient is normally shocked. Yeah, you could just get a station on can on steroid counselling. So you could like you could also for bisphosphonates as well. So fluids and IV hydrocortisone. Yeah, exactly. Well done. A to E fluids. What what do we want to monitor? Part of our A to E. What do we check at the end? What don't we forget about? Glucose, exactly. Well done. So basically, the stat thing is you want to give them 100 milligrams of IV hydrocortisone. I would remember that dose. I mean, it's quite easy to. And then fluid bolus is literally like as if you were resuscitating a shocked patient, 500 mils, 0.9% saline, up to two litres, and then you need senior input if they've still not like stabilised, their blood pressure hasn't come up. Um, and then obviously we want to monitor the blood glucose and kind of concurrently we're getting the bloods done to check the cortisol ACTH their um, electrolytes and if they've had an infection for example like that's triggered it then we want to do like culture it to see what's what um they've what infection they've got but that's kind of all going on whilst you've already treated them so you're not waiting for results of any of those things um before you do it um so basically with this hydrocortisone you continue it six hourly until the patient stabilizes and then after one day you can give them oral replacement because in the crisis we've given them IV hydrocortisone and then um, they kind of reduce it taper it back down to their what they should be taking normally over about three to four days um, but basically the the big thing to remember is that you just give them IV hydrocortisone immediately and you fluid replace them because they're shocked um, so it's, it's kind of straightforward in the sense that you would take an A to E approach like you would normally um, and then just don't forget about the hydrocortisone because it's an Addisonian crisis. OK, so my final thing is a bit of a niche. SBA. Um, so, oh, sorry, I think that text is really small, but um, if you can read that, what anyone thinks this is. Yeah. OK, well, yeah, well done. So it is Sheehan syndrome. Um, so what has made you put C? What what symptoms have pointed you towards that? Or what is C? If either one of you can. Yeah, so it's caused by the postpartum hemorrhage. Yeah, well done. OK, so basically it's Sheehan syndrome, which, as you say, it's caused by um, postpartum hemorrhages and basically means that the pituitary gland kind of necroses after a huge PPH. Um, and yeah, so it's, yeah, sorry to put the answer up. Um, so it necroses and kind of like it can go undiagnosed for ages and they have all these kind of non-specific symptoms but basically obviously all of the hormones are under the control of the pituitary gland practically so you're getting like problems with like thyroid function and like you, amenorrhea because of the LH FSH axis so you're going to get they're not going to have periods they might be depressed they're going to get hair loss postural hypertension basically because eventually it can affect also the adrenal glands so that's 
kind of linking it in with Addison's a bit. Um, and it, it, it like Addison's can kind of be acutely exacerbated. So a patient might be kind of like toddling along and being fine and then they get ill and they get an exacerbation of all these symptoms basically. And they're under the care of specialists. You don't need to know like specific management, but essentially you're going to replace their hormones. Um, that's kind of niche. Like you don't need to know a lot about Sheehan's at all. Basically what I put on that slide. Um, but it's just something to be aware of because again, it's very like loads of random symptoms. So well done for picking that up. Um, okay, so that is basically that. That's everything for me for Addison. Does anyone have any questions about anything that we've done so far? Nope. Okay, well then I'm gonna let Ahmed continue. You're muted. Thank you very much for that. Okay, so we've got Mrs. M, so the patient who came in after the pneumonia, and because she's quite unwell, as often somebody with an Addisonian crisis might be, uh, it's been decided to admit her from the medical take, and you're the F1 on the admitting ward. So this is less of an exam thing, more of a practical thing for when in, you know, three years or so, you're actually the F1 doing a medical job. There are certain things that should be done for a patient once they've been admitted, and usually it's the F1 who does these things. Um, what sort of, and these sort of things are more on the medical side. So any patient who comes in, really, they're sort of things that should be prescribed, things that should be put in place. Any ideas? So I've got about four in my head. And I know that sounds really vague, but if I go into any more detail, I'm giving stuff away. <laughs> yep. Okay, perfect. You've immediately got them. Yeah, so we need a VTE assessment. Oh, God, this is brilliant. <laughs> you guys have all, already immediately got it. So as Precious has said, you're going to need a VTE assessment. Jessica said fill out the medication chart. Exactly. So you're going to need to prescribe the regular medications. Obviously, a patient, for example, who's coming with Parkinson's disease, you do not want to have them admitted and then forget to give them their medication and they go into, um, they develop a dystonia or something like that. Nowadays, Jordan's absolutely right. You want to make sure they've had a COVID test done. And Frank's got on the really, really important bit, which is the treatment escalation plan, which is often forgotten. So you're admitting a patient. Are they for recess? Are they for what's their ceiling of care? Is it ICU or is it ward based care? Fantastic. And Patrick's being topical, which is another important thing, is actually making sure that the management plan is being done. So we've said prescribe her regular meds, any PRNs. You will be repeatedly told by F1s how one of the most annoying things when you're on call is being asked to come prescribe paracetamol for a patient. So if a patient's admitted, just put, put it on their PRN. If they are in some pain, then they can be given paracetamol and you don't have to be bleeped at three in the morning or whoever is on call. Uh, the VT prophylaxis, clarifying the treatment escalation plan. And you can always ask your senior, you know, do you think they're for resource or not? The way I've seen um, people talk about it is they will ask you, you know, can you know, would you want to be the person who's doing CPR, you know, uh, on this person, hearing their ribs crack, that sort of thing. If you think they can take it, then sure. But if it's, you know, a really frail 89 year old gentleman or lady and you think, no, that would be putting them through a lot, then you're probably not going to put them for full escalation of care. You're probably going to put them on a DNAR. And sort of miscellaneous things like if there's a next, next of kin contact contacting them after the patient's consent if you can get it or finding it if there isn't one and COVID swabs okay so next thing that probably makes sense is let's talk about VTE prophylaxis so who gets VTE prophylaxis or who should get it Because this is going to be something you'll be prescribing a hell of a lot. The useful thing is that on most prescription um, systems, whether they're written or online, 
good. Whether they're uh, written or online, you will either get a note, sorry, digital, you'll get a notification saying this patient needs VT uh, assessment, or it will be at the front of the drug chart usually, and it's a pro forma basically. Fantastic. Precious has gone everyone admitted, which is almost entirely right. Um, Jessica's got it right, which is pretty much most people who get admitted to hospital are you going to want to give them VTE prophylaxis. Not everybody, if it's a short stay, for example, they're on an acute assessment unit and they're going to leave the next day, or it's just a day case, that like endoscopy, they're probably not going to need it. Low mobility surgery is incredibly important. If we talk about medical patients, so they haven't had surgery, why in somebody who's acutely unwell, let's say um, Mrs. M, why might she need VTE prophylaxis? What might cause somebody like Mrs. M to be at a higher risk of uh, clot forming, apart from low mobility? Sepsis is a relatively good, you know, a good example. Why does somebody with sepsis, and it's a good example because it's a bit of a uh, double-bladed sword in terms of being quite careful with VTE. Let's say, so Mrs. M came in with, um, she came in being quite unwell and she was vomiting. So what does vomiting make you? If you're vomiting profusely, what's your fluid status like? You're dehydrated, exactly. And what's going to happen to the concentration of clotting factors, given that concentration of a substance is the mass of the solute divided by the volume of solvent? Exactly, perfect, yeah. So the concentration goes up, so you're just more likely to form clots. Which And anybody who's acutely unwell, sepsis is a good example. Sepsis is a scary example because obviously you've got the other hand, which is if they get really unwell, they go into DIC. So that's a bit of a stressful one where it's do I give this person low molecular weight heparin I should probably have a chat with my reg about this okay perfect so the reason I'm going through anticoagulation stuff is it's been brought up in feedback as something people would like to go through uh, sort of as a bit of a speed run which is exactly what we're going to do things like because there's quite a lot of overlap for example between anticoagulants antiplatelets and things like that so we're going to quickly go through those. We're not going to go into immense detail, um, but I'd happily do that at another point if people want to. It's more just getting a general idea. And we're not specifically talking about when to use them, because obviously when you're learning about PEs, for example, you will know, OK, I'm going to give I'm going to give a DOAC or uh, I'm going to give low molecular weight heparin. What we're mainly talking about is the drugs themselves and things to consider when you're doing them. Right. So. Quick refresher off the clotting cascade. Um, we've got your intrinsic, extrinsic. All we're really putting this for is to understand where the anticoagulants come into play. So you know your warfarin, uh, which is 1972, factors 10, 9, 7, and 2, as well as protein CNS, which is important. And then everything else, so the heparins and the DOACs and so on, is centered around thrombin, which is factor 2 activated, and factor 10 activated. And that's really where they essentially what the targets are eventually. Some of, some of them act on them directly. So you've got, for example, your direct thrombin antagonists like, um, like dabigatran, and others act indirectly, like your heparins, which act around to thrombin 3. So we'll start with unfractionated heparin, which is an interesting one because you won't see it a lot. Who probably gets unfractionated heparin? In your head, in your mind, two are the sort of people that get unfractionated heparin if they need anticoagulation. So surgical patients might get unfractionated heparin, but you can often give them low molecular weight heparins. P possibly. What problem will the patients have that might make them unsuitable? Ah, perfect. Jessica's got it. People whose renal function is completely, completely shot will often be the ones who are most suitable for unfractionated heparin. The reason being is actually you often have to mod, you know, modulate the dose when it's 
when they're severely impaired, but it's not. It's practically the only one where even if their GFR is non-existent, it can still be safe to give. Whereas all the others below a certain threshold, you really shouldn't be giving it because then it will just accumulate. The reason for this is most of uh, most of unfractionated heparin's uh, meta metabolism and so on and inactivation is done in the liver compared to compared to the other compared to its derivatives. Roger's got a point in terms of people with acute bleeding risk. Why is unfractionated heparin good? Uh, or a better idea for people who could go either way. They need anticoagulation, but they could very easily start bleeding. What's good about unfractionated heparin there? Half-life is a good point. It indeed does have the shortest half-life of any of the heparins. Hepar uh, any short half life than any of its derivatives really because it is heparin. Perfect, Jordan's got it spot on. It's the one which has got the easiest reversal. So what is the reversal agent for the heparins? Might come up in SBAs, yep. Well done, Roger Jordan. Yeah, protamine sulfate, fantastic. Protamine will bind to heparin and essentially inactivate it. It's most responsive, uh, the unfractionated heparin is most responsive to it, which is why you can reverse it quite quickly. It's the one that it binds to it the most. In terms of sort of thinking about the hierarchy of heparins, the reason why we have the derivatives is that heparin is a huge molecule. On a molecular level, it is massive. So it's not, it can sometimes be a bit unpredictable compared to the others in terms of its bioavailability and things, but also that makes it just generally harder to, harder to, work, harder to work with. So the sort of derivatives, which are the low molecular weight heparins, which as the name suggests, have a low molecular weight, are generally, well, they need less monitoring. You're kind of happier giving them to a patient subcut and sending them home, for example. Right. So we've talked about reversal agent. This really applies to all anticoagulants, basically. If somebody is on an anticoagulant, and just how we talked about steroid counselling station, what about anticoagulant counselling? What lifestyle changes should you be telling somebody who's been started on an anticoagulant, whether it's warfarin or the pixaban, or you've sent them home with anoxaparin, subco injections? No contact sports is really important. Don't be on warfarin and then go and play rugby the next day or the next week. That's not a good idea. Perfect. Trauma, fall, seek medical help. Let's think of more like less obvious ones, but very common sense ones. What is one of the most common sites of bleeding, especially in kids, in young adults? And sometimes it just happens idiopathically. We've probably all had it at some point. Yeah, nosebleeds, epistaxis. So what might you tell a patient um, who's on, let's say, warfarin to not do? It's common sense, but like you still have to tell people. Yeah, don't pick your nose. You'll see it next year in peds, um, which is if they're bleeding from their nose, don't pick your nose. Don't get into fights, it's a good shout as well. Don't pick your nose. Also, don't blow your nose too hard, which is more of an adult thing, because then you might start a nosebleed and you're anticoagulated. And then there's also the common se sense stuff. Be careful in the kitchen. If you're, you know, with a knife be extra careful nail clippers is a surprising one you might sometimes see someone who's come in with a bleed which hasn't stopped after they went a bit too far with a nail clipper so just things like telling a person to be careful with those right so real quick with unfractionated heparin so we've said it works by inactive sorry activating or really super activating antithrombin 3 it's sort of causes a conformational change that makes antithrombin 3 just about i think it's at least 50 times more effective and anti-thrombin 3 inactivates thrombin which is 
factor two activated and 10a. Often it's IV, but you can give it subcut. And what you guys have really said, which is patient with severe renal impairment or who needs quick modulation of anticoagulation, don't want to give it after major trauma, obviously. Why don't we like the idea maybe of heparin in someone with acute bacterial endocarditis? What could be the problem there? It's a bit of a niche one, so don't worry if you don't know. So the gist of it is that, especially with staph endocarditis, staphylococcal endocarditis, there is, they're at high risk, staph ones, of transforming, of emboli transforming uh, and becoming hemorrhagic. So you're, uh, yeah, so instead of having an embolus, suddenly it, it just falls off and then there's just bleeding. Um, so that's why especially heparin is contraindicated in bacterial endocarditis. And in terms of interactions, heparin's a funny one. Uh, of course, there's your, you know, be careful giving it with only other anticoagulants and NSAIDs. But also other things increase the risk. Cyclosporin, trimethoprim, it's a bit weird. Angiotensin receptor blockers and ACE inhibitors are a weird one as well. Uh, general stuff which tend to increase bleeding risk, which you will see repeatedly through these slides, are the antidepressants, uh, the SSRIs and SNRIs. So keep an eye out for those if somebody's got an anticoagulation. The serotonin is involved in platelet activation, and since these things deal with platelets, they can inactive they can lead to inactivated platelets and the person just bleeding. Right. So we've talked about everything there. Let's talk about our low molecular weight heparins, which are basically our mainstay and the ones you'll be prescribing the most. So we've talked about giving them in VTE prophylaxis, also in treatment. Somebody earlier mentioned treatment of uh, MIs. So you can give low molecular weight heparins to treat uh, acute coronary syndrome, but the only one licensed for STEMIs is noxaparin under NICE. Don't really need to know that. And to do that, you give it you give it uh, IV. Again, not really much different in the heparins, other than you need to be more careful with renal renal function, and it's just generally safer. It's usually just safer than heparin because it's more it's more predictable, but very very similar and far far more common nowadays. And then we talked about indications for VTE prophylaxis a bit earlier. So you talked about high risk patients, which are surgery, trauma, really immobile, malignancy, obesity, hypercoagulability, so that's things like dehydration. Pregnancy and the postpartum period entirely changed the game with anticoagulation. That's something we'll come across next year with obstetrics. I wouldn't worry about it now. But things like warfarin being contraindicated in pregnancy because it increases the risk of um, certain malformations in the fetus. Orthopedic patients and VT is really, really important because often they might not be able to mo mobilize very quickly and they're at even higher risk of immobility. And then also you're being kind of careful because they've also sometimes got a significant bleeding risk um, and previous VT is a huge risk factor. Right. Fonda Paranax. Fonda Paranax is a weird one in that it's a derivative of heparin, but it's very different to the other two, the low molecular weight heparins and the um, and the unfractionated heparin. Anyone know when we prefer Fonda Paradox? There's a good chance you go through medical school and never see anybody on it. I have never seen anyone on it. Yeah. You'll never see somebody on it if you're the Royal Free because they don't really need it. Yeah, really good. So Fonda Paranax is massively preferred for ACS because there is evidence that it's actually safer in terms of bleeding events. So what you'll see is especially with people with end stemmies who can't go for PCI uh, immediately, but you don't want the clot to get any bigger. Fonda Paranax is actually preferred because the evidence uh, the evidence base. No, you didn't make up body at all. Yeah. So especially end stemmies where you see part of the management is anticoagulation, you'll see Fonda Paranax. This is why you won't see the Royal Free because it's a 
it's an ACS center, and usually they don't need to wait. They will just have their PCI. But it's safest for that. And also, because it's the most different and barely really a heparin anymore, what side effect of heparins is almost non-existent in, uh, with Fundaparinex? It's a heparin-specific side effect. Or it consequence. Even has heparin in the name. Yeah, so NSTEMI is usually fond of Paranax plus dual antiplatelet therapy, plus all the stuff that comes out. Like Not DIC, but you get in there. This is sort of a weird adverse outcome of giving somebody heparin. Yes, perfect. Heparin induced thrombocytopenia hit, which we will talk about on the next slide. But Fondoparanax, I think, I had a look and there's basically only case studies. And I found about two, like, two cases of Fondoparanax associated hit. So it's good for people who've had previous episodes of that. Uh, again, and you're seeing a repeated trend, the contraindications are in people who could bleed. Um, epidural anesthesia or surgery. Why are we careful with anticoagulation in people who have spinal surgery or th something like an epidural or need a lumbar puncture? What complication are we scared of? Yeah, perfect. Epidural. Ep so the epidural bleeding, because the uh, because you have the dura mater above, it kind of restrains the bleeding, so you get uh, you get an epidural hematoma, and then because the blood can't go anywhere, it builds up and it starts compressing the spinal cord, and it can lead to paralysis. And yes, Patrick, fondoparanax isn't a low molecular weight heparin; it is distinct from them, and it's not unfractionated heparin. It's it's entirely synthetic, uh, and it's based on heparin, but it's so it works through it's works in a similar way in that it works through antithrombin 3 but it binds to it differently it but uh, it binds to it. it it's it's derived from heparin it binds to antithrombin 3 but unlike heparin it only indirectly activates factor 10a so it doesn't do anything about thrombin it's it's different enough that it's indication that it can sort of get away without heparin induced thrombocytopenia and it's got a different profile in ACS. And the stuff is relatively the same. Be careful with renal impairment. Uh, be careful with hepatic impairment. Don't give it to people who could bleed. Be careful if they're on an antidepressant or an NSAID. You can't reverse it. Now, the reason why you can't reverse it is entirely why it's good for heparin induced thrombocytopenia. It's almost nothing like the heparin, so protamine doesn't really do much for it. Uh, and the lifestyle changes are exactly the same. Right, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Why, you know, what's the weird thing about heparin-induced thrombocytopenia? What would you expect from a thrombocytopenia in terms of bleeding? Bleeding more, bleeding less? You'd expect bleeding more, exactly, because it's now thrombocytopenia. However, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is actually a pro-thrombotic state. Anyone know why? It's paradoxically pro-thrombotic. It's a bit like how... Um, the same reason why complement levels are the same reason why complement levels C3, C4 are low in lupus. It's a similar, it's a similar theme to that. So yeah, you get the, it's autoimmune, so you get antibodies. So what Jessica's saying, you get antibodies against the heparin. They also the tail end, so the FC part, the um, that binds to platelets and it activates them, and then activated platelets form clots. And in your sort of assay, when you're doing your full blood count, you're obviously measuring free platelets. You're not measuring platelets in the clot. So paradoxically, you get the measurement of thrombocytopenia, but really that's only because all the platelets are being used up in clots. Same like DIC, actually. 
That's why it's a thrombocytopenia, but it's pro-thrombotic. The antibodies activate, not only bind to heparin, but they also bind to platelets and activate them. So when do you suspect it? Anyone with uh, anyone on heparin who starts displaying any signs of clotting. So that could be purpura, it could be they've become short of breath, it could be they've got a swollen leg, it could be chest pain. So you immediately swap it, uh, stop it, and often because these patients are on heparin, they're obviously going to need some anticoagulation. The interesting thing is you don't switch to warfarin until the platelets are back to their lower normal limit, which is 150, because you have a high risk of warfarin necrosis, which is basically horrible skin gangrene you can get with warfarin. Giving them platelets will make it worse. Why? Why will giving them platelets make it worse? Yeah, more platelets form clots, exactly. Uh, and then to treat it, you swap the um, you swap either to fungal paranax because it does it's got a really low risk, or usually, and the ones that are actually licensed for it are the direct thrombin uh, antagonists. And so that's dabigatran, agathroban, and that's the anticoagulation. So treatment, stop the heparin, and then anticoagulate them with something which isn't a heparin, but also not warfarin. Which then brings us on to warfarin. <laughs> I hate warfarin. Um, the only good thing about it is that it's cheap. But I'm not going to talk about the mechanism. He the important thing with warfarin to remember is that it's almost never, in fact, I've never seen it used as a treatment for a clot. It is prophylactic. It doesn't bust clots like the heparins. It just really is fairly good at stopping new clots from forming. So that's when you use it. It's always a preventative thing, really. Sometimes it might be off license for treatment, but you don't really see that often. Contraindications are literally common sense. Don't give it to somebody if they are going to bleed a lot. Uh, but then there are cautions as well. So there's a common sense caution, which is if you think a person is going to fall, they're really old and frail, maybe not warfarin. In fact, that's a sort of that's more of a fifth year thing, but that sort of medication justification of, you know, risk benefit. If I give this person warfarin, they won't clot, but they might, if they fall, they're going to be really, well, really disabled or dead. Uh, also, weirdly, thyroid dysfunction. So thyroid dysfunction increases bleeding risk if you're on warfarin. What interacts with warfarin? What drugs interact with warfarin? Lots is the right answer. In fact, I would almost go as far to say as practically almost anything, which is another reason why warfarin is a real pain in the neck. And in terms of lifestyle, what additional... So we've talked about things like contact sports and stuff like that. There are additional things, specifically dietary. So, for example, if you're unlucky enough to get a warfarin counselling station in your OSCE, which they're not mean. No broccoli. Why don't we give them broccoli? <laughs> well, whilst Patrick's answering that, what juices do we tell them to avoid? Oh, yeah, you've already. Yeah, exactly. So what Jessica said, green leafy, green leafy things are um, rich in vitamin K, so you will kind of defeat the whole point of giving them warfarin. And pregnancy is a huge contraindication. Yes, I didn't mention it because year five, but they're contraindicated in pregnancy. Um, all the P450 inhibitors, Jordan said, yeah, all the P450 inhibitors and inducers are going to interact with it, send the INR one way or the other. It's just a very annoying drug. It's cheap, though, which is good, but it's an absolute pain. How many days before surgery do you tell somebody to stop warfarin? That's something that'll come up in SBA, so worth knowing. Five, fantastic. Uh, we usually, if someone started on warfarin, we have to bridge them over with a few days off something like low molecular weight heparin. Why is that? Why do we give somebody five days of, let's say, tinsaparin um, whilst they've started uh, warfarin? 
this is a fun farm thing, which is why I like it. I like drugs. That came out wrong. Takes a while to work, but there's... So it's an anticoagulant. Yes, perfect. Roger's got it. It's initially prothrombotic. Why? The clue is in what it acts on, so it's not just those four factors. Also, there's another... There are another two things which are uh, essentially refreshed by vitamin K, and they're important for anticlotting. So your protein C and S, so protein C and S are, yeah, perfect, Patrick's got it. Protein C and S are involved in busting clots and they're both also reactivated by uh, vitamin K or via vitamin K. The thing is their half-life's a lot shorter than the uh, those two factors. So they get uh, inhibited first. So initially you're actually prothrombotic with warfarin. So you need cover with a low molecular heparin before, uh, for a few days until now you've started inhibiting your factors because like Precious said it takes a few days to work on the actual clotting factors. Okay and uh, real quick and this is also SPAable INR reversal so if the INR is too high let's say my INR is less than eight and I am not bleeding let's say it's between five and eight and I am not bleeding. Scared what are you going to do? This is SPAable stuff. Good point. So Jessica's gone reverse for Vit K. This is the only time where you don't use vitamin K. Every other circumstance where the INR is above five, you are going to use vitamin K. However, if the person isn't bleeding and the INR is between five and eight, all you do, according to NICE, is just stop the warfarin for a day or two, recheck their INR and commence later. So just to quickly run through, and this is, if you know this, then you're set for any SBA that comes on that. INR between five and eight, no bleeding, just don't take warfarin for a couple of days. Minor bleeding, then what Jessica said, which is just give INR, uh, just give IV vitamin K and restart when the INR is back to five or less. If it's above eight, you still, you're still going to treat it even if they're bleeding or not, which is you stop the warfarin and you give the vitamin K, but this is oral, which is off license, but that's the guidance. And you check it again 24 hours, the INR, and if it's still high, then you give it again minor bleeding now it's iv vitamin k so oral for no bleeding iv for minor bleeding and major bleeding it doesn't matter what the inr is you treat it the same way which is stop the warfarin obviously give them iv vitamin k and you're also giving them dry prothrombin co uh, complex so that is your that's your that's your management of a major bleed okay last thing that we're on to is the doax What's the fuss about those? Why are they good? Why do we like DOAX compared to Warfarin? Why do I like DOAX compared to Warfarin? Why does Anoush like DOAX compared to Warfarin? Why does Divya probably like DOAX compared to Warfarin? So you can discharge patients on um, you can discharge patients on Warfarin as well, but no monitoring. You don't need to monitor them, which is bloody fantastic because Warfarin is annoying. I'm not going to go through the monitoring schedule for warfarin. Side effects is another good point. Warfarin has annoying side effects, nausea, skin discoloration, uh, and they, the DOAX don't, which is nice. What else is good for them? Less interactions, that's such a big thing. So we talked about warfarin and how it's a pain of a medication because it interacts with nearly everything like literally whenever you see a question with warfarin look at the rest of the drugs look at the rest of the drugs because there's a good chance they're going to ask you something about interactions or what drug was responsible for their INR being high DOAX are less of an issue with that there's still a fair few but they're significantly less of an issue so quick run through this top bit is useful if there's an x in the name it inhibits factor uh, factor 10 x x if there isn't, then you've got that like dabagatran, it goes for factor two activated, so thrombin. 
Like warfarin, they are oral, hence the name direct oral or novel oral anticoagulants. Here's a thing which is useful to know because this has only been done in the past few months. Now, the first line treatment for um, VTE, if someone's come in with a PE or a DVT, is actually to give them a NOAC or uh, DOAC, same thing. Oh yeah, just to clarify, DOACs and NOACs are the same thing. Sometimes people get confused, they're the same thing. Uh, we prefer DOAC now because they're no longer really novel. They've been around for a while. But they're the first line now. That's a new thing. That's only been in the last few months. So worth remembering, we don't go straight for the low molecular weight heparin now. We only, you know, we give it uh, if they can't tolerate the DOAC for whatever reason. But ideally, we give DOAC now. Uh, contraindications, an interesting one, and this is a bit of a niche one, but they're contraindicated in um, antiphospholipid syndrome especially if they're positive for all three of the antibodies because they appear to increase the risk of recurrent thrombosis, uh, which is why actually warfarin is preferred in uh, antiphospholipid syndrome, one of the few times where it is. Kidneys and liver, you need to be careful. If the creatinine clearance, which is an estimate of, uh, which is an estimate of your, well, your true GFR is low, then you need to be very, very careful. There's no real threshold at which you go, okay, I'm not going to give it, which is better than warfarin, but you need to be careful, a bit like fondaparinax, sorry, a bit like heparin. And if they've got any form of coagulopathy from liver cirrhosis, then don't give it because they're going to bleed. A uh, reversal agent, the good thing is because their half-lives are quite predictable, you usually don't need a reversal agent. The only one, and this is a past many thing, is this antibody called idarucizumab for dabigatran. They're working on one for apixaban apparently. And the beautiful thing is you don't need to monitor it and there are no dietary interactions. However, we really hoped that with these, because you don't need to monitor, people would adhere to them better. They don't. And also, even when you factor in costs for appointments, for monitoring, for warfarin, they're still expensive, so just unfortunate. And then the last thing is antiplatelets. The one thing I will say with antiplatelets, antiplatelets don't bust clots. Antiplatelets just stop a clot from getting bigger, which is why we give them in dual antiplatelet therapy, like when someone's ha having ACS. If there is a clot, they'll stop it from getting bigger. They'll stop platelets aggregating and activating. I'm not going to say much about them because they pop up all over the place, but people can have allergies to them, like with aspirin, in which case don't give it, and you don't need to monitor them, don't need to really give lifestyle advice, and they are relatively safe. Like, for example, you know, aspirin, you don't really need to stop in an AKI if it's low dose. They're relatively safe in renal dysfunction, which is always, always good. But the only important thing to know about antiplatelets in this context is they're not anticoagulants. They're different. Some people get muddled on that. And finally, just general things to always know with patients who are on anticoagulants. So we've talked about interactions, so always double, triple check for drug interactions if someone's on an anticoagulant. Rules change in pregnancy, we've said that. What other healthcare professional is it really important um, for them to know about in terms of anticoagulants? So the patient has to be told, if you go see these guys, tell them you're on warfarin or tell them you're on rivaroxaban, please. Yes, dentists. There is nothing worse for a dentist than to start doing a filling or something. And surgeons do, yeah. There's nothing worse for a dentist. And usually they'll remember to tell their surgeons. Dentists, now they're quite a bit better at sort of screening. But there's nothing worse than to be going to do a filling or something and the patient starts gushing blood from their tooth. Um, always, 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 and this is part of the nice guidance, if a patient on an anticoagulant hits their head, they're going to get a CT head. I don't, you know, you don't care what their GCS is, you don't care if they're walking around fine, they're going to get a CT head. It doesn't matter. The risk of a subdural hematoma is just too high, and they might be asymptomatic, and then three weeks later fall into a coma. They're always going to get one. Patrick's already said, if a patient has any sort of major bruising or bleeding, they need to seek urgent medical advice. And the last thing, which is technically important with all drugs, but when somebody is on an anticoagulant, and this is to do with something that we mentioned on the last slide, which is an unfortunate thing with the DOACs, which we thought they would be good for, but they haven't, what do you need to check? It's technically with any drug, but anticoagulants especially. What should you always ask?
Someone comes in and they're on Warfarin. Are you taking it? Exactly. Thank you, Jessica. People te tend to remember that with things like antidepressants, antipsychotics, but it's really important with any drug, really, especially anticoagulants. If somebody is not taking their warfarin and they get, you know, they come in and you think, oh, they're not on warfarin, uh, they're on warfarin, so it's probably not a PE. But then if you went and asked them, they say, um, don't really like it. And then you go, oh, it's a PE. So always, always remember to ask. OK, that was a bit of a, a speed run through anticoagulants and stuff. Basically, important points are in this slide and the table is sort of structured in a way where it's like, OK, that's just quick revision stuff. So main things to remember, drug interactions and changes of dose in renal impairment and hepatic impairment. And that's about it. I hope that was useful. We will stick around for any questions. Please fill in feedback form for us. Anusha's just put it on the chat. And yeah.